COVID has impacted dramatically on an overwhelming number of businesses and industries, and the fashion sector is no exception. Some within the industry are arguing more so than most. But what does recovery actually look like for the industry, and what plans does it have in place to help revitalise the industry? Joining us today to discuss what the recovery looks like and what plans are in place and how badly the industry is affected is Phoebe Garland. Now, Phoebe is a co-director and head of product of Garland and Garland Fashion, a fashion brand and management consulting agency known as the G&G Collective. Phoebe is a regular contributor and speaker consultant in the fashion industry, and Phoebe specialises in the business of fashion wholesale strategy all the way through to brand development and range. Phoebe is also an industry advisor and board member of the Fashion Design Studio, which is one of Australia's leading fashion colleges and now is a full university degree with some of Australia's leading fashion designers such as Alec Perry, Akira Isagawa, Romance and Born, Ginger and Smart, Bianca Spender and many others have graduated. And today, Phoebe's here. Welcome, Phoebe. Hi, thanks for having me. Now, the fashion industry, like most industries, has been hit pretty hard by COVID. What are the plans? How do we get it back to where it was? Look, when the first lockdown happened, um, it was actually a blessing for the industry. Um, retail was really tough before that first 2020 lockdown. Um, and it reset the industry. It was actually probably the, one of the best things that ever happened. Um, this side of... COVID um, from the latest outbreak in December, um, the July lockdowns hasn't been that great for the industry. It's, um, we were really blindsided by Delta when we had that lockdown um, and no one was preparing to go into one of our longest lockdowns. Um, that was one of our longest lockdowns in Sydney. I know Melbourne, it doesn't even compare to what you guys have had, um, but Basically, the impact of that was it gave it was the inability to clear winter stock for retailers in July, which is normally their clearing time, and to allow that sort of clearing old stock and allowing that new season to come in. So obviously, new season then had to be pushed out a bit so they could still clear winter. So it pushed the seasons back, which obviously then when December hit um, and we had the outbreak, even though we weren't in lockdown. There was no government support um, and essentially people were staying home. So it was like we were in lockdown anyway. It was particularly bad. We got hit quite badly in New South Wales from that. Um, and it really has dented consumer confidence. So it was it, it, it has been a little bit frustrating um, with them, with for, particularly for retailers, their ability to clear summer stock as well. Um, and, you know, with no government support and obviously the government support can't last forever but i feel that this time around it it it's it feels a lot different you know it's um it's it's a lot tougher this time around than it was in in 2020 so um i think also we're coming up to an election year which always puts a cloud on business um and with this war on as well it, it isn't helping um so where we go from here, I think that the government and, you know, is going to have to be very cautious about, you know, how they approach things. I think rate rises, the impending rate rises could also impact retail spending. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in the area, which is, it is impacting business. It is impacting retail. Now, the, the oil industry suffered huge supply chain uh, problems as well. How much did that impact the fashion industry, because I know a lot of stuff comes in from overseas along the way. Is that over yeah. yet for you, for the industry, or is it still playing out? No, so that put an enormous that put an enormous um, strain on the industry, particularly if they were doing homewares, anything out of India, because obviously India was very heavily impacted. Was really everything has been running made out of India. Um, we had a label that had his makers, three of his makers. Um, died from COVID in India. That caused late deliveries. Um, it, it is still happening. The cost of freight and containers have just gone through the roof. It has really impacted businesses um, enormously. And I think we are going to still see those supply chain problems um, moving forward. Um, we don't, I think the other thing is, is that we're just heading into winter. So we don't know what 
winter is going to be like and whether or not there'll be a new strain because traditionally we have seen strains appear during winter months um, and while the latest strain has been fairly mild in comparison to what delta was we just don't know what this virus is going to throw at it so i think you know it it, it does make people nervous and new south wales has just been hit by the floods which has been dreadful um and yeah there's a lot of things that have been prominent at our industry and um there's a lot of sort of uncertainty in the area and it, i'm in the process of doing summer uh 22 buying at the moment um all my retailers are coming in and i've had six that have had to cancel this week because of floods mm. so <laughs> it's um yeah it's 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 a bit frustrating this season actually last season when we were doing winter i had to do that entire showing through lockdown and actually, surprisingly, we had a very good season. But this season feels a little bit different. Now, I'd assume that there's a lot of industries within the industries within fashion. So whether it's the high-end formal wear all the way down to the leisure and uh, active wear, I could imagine the tracksuit end of the market was great through lockdown. But with the cancellation Absolutely. of events like the Spring Carnival in Melbourne, which is a huge fashion event, that would have decimated that top end of the market and all of the other social occasions that were cancelled. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, we were incredibly fortunate um, with COVID because we specialise in lifestyle brands and they're fairly casual. Um, having said that, we do have a few fashion brands. Um, surprisingly, the one that we had that delivered late is quite, you know, it is quite fashion forward and it did remarkably well, but that was in, you know, in December where there were events on and, and it was a little bit more... Um, you know, people were sick of staying around in their tracksuit pants. Um, knitwear did incredibly for us throughout COVID and still is one of our best performing categories in fashion. Um, knitwear defies gravity um, throughout COVID. It was just, it is a category that works um, really well in COVID and out of COVID, you know. Um, I felt really sorry for anyone that was doing event wear. I think that they had to really look at their business and change it around um, very quickly just to make some money. Having said that, I do know this about women and I do know this about the industries. Women get really sick of wearing leisure wear for a particular time. It's not to say that active wear isn't a great category, but we do have our limit on how much time we can spend in our tracksuit pants. And then eventually we do want to get frocked up again and go out. So it's a temporary thing. Um, and I think that the best brands have just evolved during that period. And it was a huge adjustment for a lot of brands, COVID. I mean, we're all blindsided when it first hit. And, you know, we've lived with it for two years, but I think we get better and better with it, you know. I think it will get easier. Um, but it has, you know, with the inability to clear stock, it has become a little bit problematic for retailers. So my experience with the fashion industry as a, a former, uh, believe it or not, fashion industry person was there was a high rate of female uh, manufacturers and things like that. We know that the pandemic disproportionately affected uh, women throughout it because they were some of the, the lower end jobs that were precarious to start with. Will this see, with the supply chain uh, problems, will this see an increase in Australian manufacturing and are there still staff available? to fill that need? Well, I actually have an Australian, it's interesting you ask that because I just, my previous podcast asked exactly the same question. So it's a really valid question. Um, I actually have an Australian made knitwear brand called Umi Knitwear, which is manufactured in Melbourne. And it is the most beautiful product. And the people behind it are just absolutely delightful. I love working with them. And it's the Australian made um, demand absolutely went through the roof. Um, the way that they work is, is that they got absolutely inundated throughout COVID. And they actually said to me, look, we've actually got a bit of a growth problem. And I said, it's a nice problem to have. Um, they bought a new machine. She said, this time round, we're going to schedule production into two different months. Um, and the, the wonderful thing about it is, is that they can actually manufacture, they make to order. So when I get in-season orders, it turns around in two to three weeks, which is fantastic. You know, it really allows people to respond to demand. Um, the demand for Made in Australia is definitely there, particularly with the precariousness with China. Um, and 
there will always be Australian made product. And I think that one of the myths about China as well, and I will defend China in the sense that their products are excellent. Um, people view China as having low quality products and that just simply isn't true. Um, we work a lot with China and, you know, there is various different um, qualities that come out of China and some of the best qualities come out of China that are European brands. Um, so to write China off as just a country that produces low end is just not true at all. And I think that what we have to really be careful of, um, and it is difficult, it's a, it's a diplomatic fine line, um, is that we can't, you know, we are reliant on China. That is, it is, a, it is an issue um, and it is an area of concern. Um, the technology in China, we cannot easily replicate in Australia. Um, my stepdaughter, who had a, a big apparel business, said they just don't have the technology here to produce garments that they do in China. You know, we've had the majority of offshore manufacturing for so long. While we can make Made in Australia, and I do have a, you know, a beautiful friend, Joe Farage, who owns Farage, um, he has his own factory. And the ones that are making in Australia have their own factory and they can control that. But to really invest in Made in Australia, and it, you know, it's great to see. Also, on another hand, the foresters investing with RM Williams back into Australian manufacturing. I absolutely love that, and I think that it's wonderful that they've bought RM Williams because it really should be under Australian um, ownership. That really understand that heritage of that brand, um, and they're bringing manufacturing back to South Australia. And I think that that's wonderful. I love that Nicola went to the factory and she spoke to all the workers and. She realised all the issues. Um, it would be wonderful if we could bring more manufacturing back into Australia. Um, the reality is, though, we do have high wages and we can't compete with those wage costs that China and India have. Um, I think that the only way is if, you know, if there was more government funding in that and, and we had that, um, but it's a question of, you know, it, it is a question of whether or not also the consumer at the end of the day will pay for it, you know, um, in knitwear they will. Um, will they pay for it in a t-shirt? I don't know, you know. Um, there's certain things that are obviously more price pointed than others. They obviously pay for it in Joe's suits with Farage and his, you know, tailored wear, it's exquisite quality, it's beautiful product. Um, so in certain categories, they will. Um, and again, it comes back to those categories in fashion, whether or not they will. They, they may not pay for it in a basic T-shirt. Uh, one final question before we go, Phoebe, just out of interest. Have we seen a change in the average sizing? Not that I've put on any weight because of the COVID gear loads. Have we actually seen an increase in the average waist size for, for men especially, just so I don't feel bad about myself? I think we've all had, I think, you know, I think COVID kilos is very much a real thing when you're in lockdown and you can't get out and about and, you know, walking or something, you are limited. So I wouldn't feel bad about that. I'm sure you're not the only one. Um, I'm yet to see the statistics on it. Um, elastic waist pants will be your best friend. And I, by the way, you look amazing. So I wouldn't really worry about that anyway. Um, I think that, you know, Fortunately, the lockdowns are over and we can all work on ourselves a little bit better. But yeah, I mean, look, everybody suffered from COVID kilos and it's the nature of the industry. But that's that's the magic thing about elastics and, um, you know, non-structured garments. I specialise in that. It's wonderful. Oh, Phoebe, I, I draw a fine line between one, one size fits all as an estimate or a challenge for me. But anyway, Phoebe Garland from Garland & Garland, thanks so much for your insights into the fashion industry through COVID. Thanks so much for having me.